Good morning and welcome to today's lecture, the ninth in the current topic series. Up until now, the lectures have focused primarily on the genomic analysis of mammalian systems, most notably human. But today we're going to switch gears and discuss not humans, but the small creatures that live on and inside them, namely microbes. In healthy adults, it's estimated that microbial cells outnumber human cells by a factor of 10 to 1. However, these communities of microbes have not been studied until recently, so we don't know too much about their influence on human development, physiology, immunity, or nutrition. Our speaker today, Dr. Julie Segre, is working to understand how the human microbiome, that is the collection of bacteria and other microbes that share our space, influence human health and disease. In particular, she studies the microbes that inhabit the skin, the human body's largest organ. Many common skin conditions are associated with either a change in the number or types of microbes that colonize the skin. By sequencing the DNA of bacteria collected from the skin of humans and mouse models of human disease, Dr. Segre's group has investigated how these bacteria contribute to health and conversely, how changes in the bacterial community structure can contribute to, con to chronic skin disorders such as psoriasis and eczema. Analysis of microbial diversity has traditionally been based on culturing microbial samples. But this method is limiting because only those bacteria that can actually grow up in culture can be sampled. So Dr. Segre's lab has been using new genomic tools that identify bacteria based on species-specific sequences in their 16S RNA uh, ribosomal genes. More recently, though, using next-gen sequencing techniques like those that Elliot Margulies discussed last month, she's begun studying complete genomic sequences of microbial organisms. In her lecture today, uh, Dr. Segre will be discussing techniques that she and others have used to analyze the genomes of microbial populations. Dr. Segre got her PhD from MIT working with Eric Lander at the MIT Genome Center. She then moved to the University of Chicago where she did a postdoctoral fellowship with Elaine Fuchs. And she came to um, NIH in 2000 with a Burroughs Welcome Career Award in Biomedical Research as a, as a tenure track investigator. She's currently a senior investigator in the epithelial biology section in the genetics and molecular biology branch of NHGRI. Please join me in welcoming Julie to present this morning's lecture. Okay, thanks. Well, um, uh, I'm going to get started, and thank you, Tara, and um, uh, for that very nice introduction, which was probably uh, better organized than my entire talk. So, um, so I'm going to start by talking even just about why the human microbe, um, or why the human microbiome, because really, for a lot of basic simple genetic disorders, we can, we can find the genetic basis of them, like cystic fibrosis. We understand what is the genetic basis or the common Delta F508 mutation. You've heard a lot about that, um, the genetic basis of disease in the previous weeks. But really, for a lot of the medical management of these disorders, including something like cystic fibrosis, which is a very um, simple Mendelian trait, there, the complication comes in the treatment of CF, and one of the major complications is the bacterial infection so it, um, that happens in the lungs. So we have to really think about what is the host-environment interaction. And although that's true of the simple disorders, uh, simple genetic disorders, and by that I mean that there's a one genetic cause, that's even more true of what are some of the most complex genetic disorders where there seems to be many components in our genetic makeup, but there's also a large degree of interaction with the environment for disorders like inflammatory bowel disease or um, the skin disorder of eczema. So in terms of why the human microbiome, well, actually, our human cells are the same in every cell, that is the DNA encoding potential. But the bacteria and the other small microbes that live in and on our bodies actually outnumber those genetic cells, the human cells. And it's not just that they outnumber us, because if you, if you do the math, like a bacterial genome, as you'll see, is about 3 million base pairs, and a, a human DNA of a human cell has about 1,000 times more genetic material 
So we still outweigh them, but if you think about that each bacteria could have a different genetic makeup, whereas human cells all have the same genetic makeup, the genetic diversity of the microbes may also be as great as the human genetic diversity. So when we think about the cause of, of human disorders and the treatment of them, it's really important for a lot of these to think about the gene-environment interactions. So um, it, uh, uh, about two years ago, the NIH Roadmap launched the Human Microbiome Project, which is to understand the genetic component of the human as an ecosystem. And the, the primary goal is to establish a baseline of what is the human microbiome to empower these future clinical studies. One of the large studies is going on where 250 healthy individuals are being recruited and sampled at five different sites to understand what is the diversity, what is the core microbiome, and say, you know, what, do, what, do, what does each individual have uniquely to identify them, and what do they share? Um, and so the five sites are really the five epithelial linings of the body, the gut, the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the vagina, and the skin, um, although we also are investigating some of the sites um, that are harder to sample because it's more invasive, like the lung epithelium. So the goals of this project are um, to sequence the human diversity on those sites, but also to sequence bacterial reference genomes. And together, those two will hopefully empower us to do metagenomic <laughs> studies that I will get to in um, more detail. But that's metagenomics is the analysis of a combined um, microbial environment. So you know, if you were to just be able to scrape the skin and then sequence the entire um, entire microbiota that you get off that. To look at the correlations of changes in microbial communities with disease state and to explore the new ethical, legal, and social implications of this field of research. So the microbiome studies really started in the environment, and this is um, Craig Venter's tour of the Sargasso Sea, where he collected seawater in all these different places. and looked at the bacteria like the prolo, um, pro, pr prolo, colo, prolo colochorus, <laughs> um, all the, you know, which is a common bacteria in the, in the sea. Um, but he also looked at the diversity and found that the diversity of the seawater is really enormous. Um, and actually, the environmental diversity seems to be much greater than the human diversity. But so, you know, this is one type of study that you can do where you can examine um, the environment in different places of the ocean, and so these are all the different places that he picked up bacteria. Or you can look in one place, and this is um, Phil Hugenholtz's study of um, a, a saline mat. So that's something where he looked from the top, so it's like a, you know, a, I mean, it's, it's like if you start from the top with the grass and you went underneath to the dirt, but, you know, took a core of the, of the earth. So in that case, you start at the top and you look what can live at the top, what needs that, um, it, you know, the oxygen. And then you go down and you see what can live in the different areas. And what he showed here was that as he goes down into the saline mat, the types of bacteria change as you travel down. So, you know, there, in the environment, there are these different ways that we can survey. And those are really the ideas that we wanted to apply to the human. So now this is a study that, um, and then I'll get more into the details of how we do this, but just, you know, what sorts of questions we want to ask is what I'm starting with. This was a study Norm Pace did where he looked at what's living in the shower heads across the United States. Um, and so these are the types of environments that then interact directly with humans um, and looking at, you know, what are the biofilms and then on the right is all the different types of bacterial organisms that he found in shower heads. So it really is about the interaction um, that the, the human ecosystem, 
the environmental ecosystems, and then the interaction between the two. So starting into how do we do this type of analysis, the, the study of bacterial diversity is typically focused on um, sequencing the 16S rRNA gene. The ribosomes of, uh, of a eukaryotic and cell and also of a prokaryotic, well, we, we tend to think about the large subunit of a ribosome and a small subunit of the ribosome, and that's where proteins are translated. But in fact, a ribosome is really 60% ribosomal RNA, and um, they give the ribosome a lot of its structure, and they also aid in the translation of the messenger RNAs. So there are, this is one of the most highly transcribed genes in a cell. And anyone who's ever run a northern knows that in a eukaryote, you base it on the 28S, the 18S, and the, and the 5S gene. That's, I mean, you can see those bands on an RNA gel. Similarly, in bacterial cells, there's a 16S gene. And there are multiple copies of this 16S gene. And the reason that we use this gene for assessing bacterial diversity is that it's a, a standard housekeeping gene. It's in many copies in the bacterial cell. And moreover, it serves as an evolutionary clock. So that if you know the, se the sequence of a 16S gene, you can use that to identify what type of bacteria do you have. And this is a way in which we talk between genomics community, um, microbiologists, and physicians, that this is a standard uh, nomenclature where the 16S is used by all of us to identify what type of bacteria um, we find. And so that's all the previous studies that I had shown you of the Sargasso Sea, um, the shower heads, these are all based on 16S sequencing. Actually, this, the, the Sargasso Sea, I'm sorry, is actually had metagenomic sequencing in it. But then you can still pull out the 16S gene even from metagenomic samples and look at that. So the 16S gene is um, extremely abundant and um, it's very easy for us to characterize it and then to talk between different disciplines with that. So one of the features of the 16S that's going to become important is that it has this structure. So when I talk about this as being an evolutionary clock, it's an RNA. It doesn't get translated into a DNA, but it's an RNA with a lot of secondary structure. So what you see here are these stems, and that's a double strand between um, two different RNA moieties and or ribonucleotides. And so these have evolutionary constraint on them in a way that these loops are less constrained. So when we want to make an identification, now I'm going to show you the 16S gene as linear. When we want to make an identification of the bacterial gene, if this is, it's 1.6 kb, so I'm showing it to you here in a linear form. Well, this is the conservation if you looked in 50 base pair windows. There are regions that are highly conserved and there are regions that are less conserved. Well, one of the first things that you might want to do, and I'll, I'll get back to how we use the sequence to identify it. One of the first things that you might want to do that you don't need to know anything else about the bacterial is you might want to know what the bacterial load is. So I do have to say that this has to be done um, with the caveat that you have to be clear that you are um, assessing what you think you're assessing. So um, if you want to calculate the bacterial load, you can put primers into these um, regions that are more highly conserved, and you can amplify like you do with a standard quantitative um, PCR. This is, again, not quantitative RT-PCR, but you're looking at quantitative PCR to know what is the bacterial load. And we did something like this when we were trying to assess what is a swab. If you swab the person's skin, how much bacteria do you remove? If you scrape the person's skin, how much bacteria do you remove? And if you do a full thickness punch biopsy, how much of the person's skin do you remove? Um, and you know that's to understand the depth of sampling and how much bacteria are you taking off. But of course there it's very important that we um, always used a very standard shape for sampling 
and that what we were interpreting was not that this is how much bacteria is present, but this is how much we were able to sample. Um, but it can get you some ideas about if two um, samples, one has a higher bacterial load than the other. So um, the way that you can calculate the bacterial load, it's very similar to how you do a standard qPCR. You see how many cycles it takes, and you can just see here that um, if we if we have 300 picograms of bacterial DNA, it will take 17.8 cycles. If you decrease the bacterial DNA tenfold, it takes three more cycles, so that's two to the third or eight times, you know, uh, eight, eight times less DNA, um, ten times less DNA, it, it, it actually works out. And then if you use three picograms of DNA, that's um, three more cycles or 3 point, you know, 3.3 more cycles. Um, and we can use that to calculate copy number, just as you would do for most qPCRs. This I'm just showing you here as normalized with E. coli and showing that if you spike the bacteria with human DNA, it just doesn't change the cycle number. So even if you have human DNA mixed together with the bacterial DNA, you can still calculate the bacterial load. Okay. So how do you study microbial diversity, which is what um, is... Uh, which is more what those samples um, were trying to do of look at what is present, not just how much. So there's really three ways. Um, first of all, there's fingerprinting, where you could amplify the 16S gene and do something where you chomp it up with restriction enzymes and look and see if there's any differences. I'm not going to cover that. I'm giving you a reference for that. Um, it is certainly the cheapest, but it's very limited in terms of what type of information you can get out of that because those bands don't have any molecular um, identifying information associated with them. Um, phylo chips are very much like microarrays where you put down unique probes for each of the known bacterial lineages and you can hybridize to them. I think that phylo chips are certainly going to be extremely important in the future when we have assessed the microbial diversity and you want to go in and see, you know, how much of the different bacterial phylum there are. Um, but at this point, you know, like any microarray, chips will never find unique sequences for you. This is like, just like if, um, as you know, you'll hear about with microarrays, why people are moving from microarrays to RNA sequencing is that, you know, the chips will never find you unique sequences. You will only find what you are looking for there. So they will be very powerful in the future, but at this point we are still in this project in a discovery mode. So finally what I will focus more on is the sequencing um, and the taxonomic classifications. One of the points that I really want to make in this talk is that for a small study, the sequencing is limiting. If you want to look at something um, and you want to compare two samples and you want to look at 200 sequences from each one, probably the sequence will be the limiting factor. How can you get 400 sequences? But if you want to do a larger study and compare um, a longitudinal study and use five different animals or five different people and look at them at three different time points, at that point the bioinformatics becomes limiting and um, I'll, I'll explain more about why that's my opinion. This is an example of the phylo chip, um, which again is very useful if what you're trying to get is an overall sweeping characteristic of the study. This is a study by um, David Roman and Pat Brown's group, um, where they're looking at what is the intestinal microbiota in the first year of life. And of course, the first year of life has a lot of changes. The child is going from um, breast milk to um, oatmeal to semi-solid food to table food. And what they found was that during this first year of life, there are many changes in the bacterial populations and that the diversity is between infants and also between times. And what you can see is that even the diversity doesn't look the same between these three people or these three infants and that there are little spikes where the bacterial diversity will suddenly switch. We don't really have any understanding of why these shifts occur and, you know, in this case they can correlate it with the clinical metadata, but what they're 
finding is that at this point the resolution that we have um, doesn't really give them the pattern in here. It just seems like there's a lot of diversity between kids. So um, if you want to sequence the 16S gene, now I'm kind of getting into the nitty gritty of it all. Um, as I was saying, there are these variable regions, and so this picture shows you as you go across um, in 50 base pair windows, V1 stands for variable region one. Now that would be one of those loops that you saw in the E. coli structure, um, whereas these regions here are the um, stems, so that's a very highly conserved sequence. So um, the way that we sequence the 16S gene is that we, we, we put our primers into these highly conserved regions that um, are here at the end of the gene, or if you want to do 454 sequencing, which gives you the 400 base pair sequences, you put your primers here into um, the highly conserved regions in the middle of the gene. So you can sequence um, either with a full length Sanger sequencing and, and um, assemble the sequences together to give you this 1.6 KB, or you can use these shorter reads, and I'll, um, I'll show you in a second the difference between those two. But one of the real take home messages from this is that the primers that you pick significantly determine the microbial diversity. So even though we talk about these primers as being um, uh, that they are, you know, that they amplify all bacteria and that they are in these conserved regions, um, that of course needs to be taken with a grain of salt. I mean, you know, even if you put a primer here into this region, you're talking and you think that you're amplifying 95% of the sequences, um, you know, that's based on what we already know that we've found. So um, you, you certainly are missing 5% of the sequences and perhaps more. And the 5% that you're missing if you're using this type of th a primer here could be very different than a someone who is using primers that are um, here and here in the different, you know, conserved regions. So it's un unfortunate at this point, but this is not like the human genome where there is a reference. Um, it is still very dependent on the tools that you are using. So it's um, still at this point complicated to use someone else's data set as a reference and then just use your own as, um, a con as, you know, a test set to see, for example, if, you know, your, if your mice with a genetic defect um, have a different microbial profile than someone else's, um, it's very hard to compare data sets between labs and know whether the difference is biological, that there is a difference, or whether it's technical, that it's based on the two groups using different primers or using different amplification techniques. Um, yeah, to a great extent, if we all agreed to use the same primers, and that's one of the goals of the Human Microbiome Project, is to say that we will all use these primers and standardize what are the conditions. Um, but there is a fair amount of uh, pushback because, of course, any of those primer sets is, um, does have their own bias. And so the bias of what we might lose if we were to do oral cavity sampling might be very different than if we were doing gut sampling. And so it, it may end up being that we end up having primers that are specific to the body site, or we may have to make some agreement like that. But in order to assess that, and there um, just recently was a paper um, that a Swedish group published on a mock community that's a similar analysis that the American Human Microbiome Project is doing, where you build a mock community and you put 20 bacteria of, that are known, and they, you put them in in different ratios, and then you amplify them with all the different primers. Because again, data is going to lead the way. I can't convince you that my primers are better than your primers if they have different results. But if we both assess them on a mock community and then I say, my primers give me back 
the microbial diversity, your primers are skewed and that they amplify firmicutes and not actinobacteria, then you might be convinced to use my primers. But until we have that type of data, there's no way that anyone can convince anyone else that their primers are better representative. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so you just got into one of the issues that the, the one of the reasons that we're really trying to build a human microbiome con consortium is to agree upon standard principles um, of how we are going to assess microbial diversity. And I, I think as with all of these types of projects, it's fine to break the rules as long as you understand that you are breaking the rules and why you're breaking the rules. Because anyone will agree that you can use your own primers if you have a reason for doing that. Um, and we may even move beyond all of this when we get, um, as I was saying, like when we get phyllo chips, then we'll, we'll, we'll move into a different bias. This is really just in the discovery mode. So how many reads do you need? Um, and this is probably going to end up being important in terms of assessing how much is a project going to cost you to do and how much bioinformatics do you need. Well, as I said, the, the two pr approaches that we currently are using are to get the full length um, 16S and, uh, with Sanger sequencing. And the advantage of that is that it allows you to um, assess your sequences compared to sam um, samples of microbial isolates that have been cultured. Um, because it really takes almost that much sequence to make a unique identification. The 454 Roche instrument um, gives you 400 base pair reads, and you know every base pair is much cheaper than doing Singer sequencing. Uh, it gives you a lot of data. Um, and for many things, this assessment that you can get with a 454 would be sufficient. You can sequence 400 base pairs um, and get conserved, you know, cross um, two variable regions and conserved regions. Selexa Lumina, um, and I know Elliot Margulies talked about all of this, so if you're interested more in the technology, um, you should certainly refer back to his um, earlier talk in this lecture series. These are going to move towards 100 base pair tags. They've moved from 35 to 75, and they will probably get to 100 base pairs. That's still a little small to identify bacterial genera, um, but it's great for whole genome bacterial sequencing. Um, and that's still the 100 base pairs, you know, again, might be enough to tell you if there's a dramatic shift, if that's what you're looking for. So this is just looking at now what type of information you get if you compare a 400 base pair sequence with a full length sequence. So Jim Cole, Jam, James Cole's group has put this um, analysis together where if you look at a full length sequence, um, and here of course you have to refer back to your own ideas about um, bacterial ta taxonomy, and this is you know the standard kingdom phylum class order family genus. So you can get different levels of taxonomic identification if you, um, if you use different le sequence lengths. So here I'm showing you the full length sequence compared to a 400 base pair sequence. And um, these other data points are uh, what 454 FLX was um, and, you know, if you were getting into Illumina sequencing. So if you have a full length sequence, of course, you know, you could identify at basically everything at the phylum level and most things at the genus level. Now, if you go to a 400 base pair sequence, of course, you can still identify everything on the phylum level, and your level of resolution to get down to the genus level drops um, slightly, and, you know, you just have to decide where you want to be, you know, what's your sweet spot for your type of analysis there. Um, and that is really about what type of level of organization and taxonomic diversity do you want to pick up. So, you know, let's move on from that because the sequencing technology has been covered. Let's say that you have these bacterial 16S sequences, and I'm just showing you here the, the 16S sequence from Staph aureus. So you've got these sequences, and um, maybe you've, uh, um, you've, you've got 
full length sequences or you have 400 base pair sequences, what are you going to do with them now? Well, um, you'd like to identify the bacterial sequence and the next thing you'd like to do is probably align your sequences. So if you, I mean, there are tools within NCBI like BLAST um, and there are um, that you could see if your sequence matches a previously cultured sequence. But um, even within this, you probably want to know if your bacterial sequence, I mean, if it's, or if it's a known bacteria, then you will get a match in here. Like if this is Staph aureus, you would get a match. But you may also be picking up the sequence of something that hasn't been previously cultured. And there are databases that, can, that contain large amounts of 16S sequence. So this is the ribosomal database project that was developed by James Cole. And what this allows you to do is to align your sequence specifically against other 16S sequences. So this is about a, um, a million 16S sequences that have been al aligned and annotated. Um, and it uses a naive Bayesian classifier so that you can um, identify what sequence you match most closely. And it kind of takes a lot of the work out of it for you so that you know, you, you might match a lot of things at the 95% level and then a smaller number of things at the 99.99% 99 .99 level and a very few things at the 99.9%. Um, now, one of the things is that different taxonomies have been developed for um, classifying bacterial sequences um, and you can uh, use Berge's taxonomy, Usabi, NCBI. For most bacteria, this won't be an, an issue. You know, all the taxonomies will agree. But there are instances where different um, groups have uh, their own taxonomy. So it, it, it is important to at least be aware of the fact that there are different taxonomies that exist. Within the RDP classifier, there also are some very nice tools. And so I've kind of pointed out that there is a tutorial associated with RDP. But you can use this sequence then if you said that you wanted to, you wanted to make primers that specifically amplified staph but didn't amplify strep, you could go in and try to use the sequence match or the probe match parts of this program to pull out what primers would be um, uh, ideal for doing those types of um, analyses. So, Based on RDP classification, and they do have a pyro sequencing pipeline, that's one of the things that actually is going to be an undercurrent to this is that people are switching from full end sequencing to the pyro sequencing, the 454. And m many of the tools are somewhat ready for getting pyro sequencing data, but not really ready for pyro sequencing data. So um, if you do intend to use 454, you, I'll, I'll try to point these things out, but you should really look at these tools and see which are, um, uh, which are, are being adapted for, for um, short pyro sequencing reads because that's a real moving target where everyone knows that people want to develop um, tools for that, but that ends up being hard. I mean, it's, you, you, you're trying to feed a lot of sequence data into these programs that were originally built for um, a smaller number of, of full ends to anger sequencing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So I think actually, so the question was, what's the number of species that a human um, has? And um, so I don't know the answer to that. And I think that I can answer that at the phylum level. I mean, so what's interesting there is that there are about 100 known bacterial phylum. And there seem to be only about eight that can inhabit the human, whereas 100 of them can live in the sea and can live in the soil. And if you sample the sea or the soil, you'll just, every sequence you get, you keep getting something unique. It seems to be a very diverse environment. There's definitely been a selective pressure put on what bacteria can live on the human. 
So at the phylum level, we're talking about a very, um, a bottleneck where it's about eight of 100 phylum. But when you get down to the level of genus or really what you're even saying species, we, we don't yet have um, enough of an exploration to know um, how many differences there are um, and whether it might end up being that the diversity is at the, at the centimeter level um, or, or if there really is a core microbiome. Um, and, and part of it, and I guess I, I should just, you know, while I'm just giving my opinions, part of it is going to be the concept of what is a species. Because bacteria exhibit horizontal gene transfer, so the concept of a species would probably mean that you're talking about a conserved 16S sequence. Um, even that answer, I don't know. How many 16S sequences would we find on a human? Um, and I don't even have an order of magnitude for you. I mean, that's the, you know, the interesting thing they talked about, the human genome, how there were going to be 100,000 genes, and then probably there's 25,000, but the, the diversity is in the splicing and in the protein forms, and so, you know, it, that can be a number that you could give in many different ways, even for humans. Yeah, I guess this, the 100,000 genes was ultimately tracked back, I think, to Wally Gilbert. Um, and as a physicist, when it turned out that there were 25,000 genes, he said how remarkable it was to have been within an order of magnitude. So um, I, I, I guess the fact that I haven't heard a number of what the order of magnitude of bacterial um, genuses on the human is, is just that really no one, well, I, 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 haven't, I haven't heard a number. So what could you do with an RDP classification? Well, this is one of the examples that I think really got um, the field started is um, Jeff Gordon's study of lean versus obese mice. And what you see here is that the, uh, and this is a, a, an animal model where the, the ratio of lean, uh, sorry, of firmicutes to bacteriodites in the, in the lean mice, and this is just the, homozygote wild type versus the heterozygote mice. In the OBOB, which are the obese mice, what you can see is that there's a statistically significant shift in the increase of firmicutes and decrease in bacteriodites. Now, with all of these, there is the concept of, you know, this is correlative data. Is the shift in the microbiota causing the obesity or is it a result of the obesity? And that's the type of information that this data can't answer for you. But this is um, at least a hypothesis generating, um, uh, um, you know, that, that the obesity may be affected by the ratio of firmicutes to bacteriodites, um, and that may be a possible target for drugs. So uh, I'm going to show later, Jeff's lab has gone on and studied this in, in humans, but I'll, uh, oh, sorry, I guess I'm talking about that right now. So um, Jeff's lab has gone on and shown that in humans, where you see up in the upper right-hand side, these are the ratio of um, firmicutes to bacteriodites, and this is people that are, have been put on a diet that were previously um, considered obese. And what you can see is that as they become leaner, the ratio of bacteriodites increases and the ratio of firmicutes decreases. Um, and he did an assessment of the change in body weight um, if they were put on a carbohydrate-restricted diet or a fat-restricted diet. So there are things that we can do easily in mice, and then, you know, if there's an answer that's provocative in mice, you can move that into humans knowing that, um, you know, the mouse studies, to do that, that's sort of, uh, to do that on mice is often 10 mice, and uh, the variation in humans is much greater, so you need to enroll more people to do that study, and that's a m much greater undertaking. So um, before I talk about how we do the analysis of the data, because we've just talked about how you do an original classification, now probably the next thing you'd like to do is a sequence alignment um, and to start thinking about what kinds of shifts do you have below the level of, of phylum. But we get onto an issue that um, 
I want to spend some time on because I don't think that it would, um, uh, it, it, it may not occur to you when you're first starting this analysis, but it will end up being a tremendous, uh, have a tremendous effect on your data. And that's the issue of chimeras. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to amplify the 16S gene and then you want to sequence them. But what happens is that um, you will get chimeras, and I'll explain to you in the next slide how you'll get chimeras. And the problem with chimeras is that you will end up with sequences that are not really derived from a bacteria. And you need to be aware of that. So here's how you get a chimera. You're sequencing many bacteria together. And what will happen is that during the amplification process, not all of your PCR products can complete their extension. So you're moving across and you're amplifying here, but then the PCR can, you know, then the PCR is over. Even if you extend for a minute and a half, you, you keep starting, starting strands that you don't finish. And so you, you fall off. And now what you have is you're at a conserved region and you anneal that to a different um, bacterial 16S and you now extend you know, you started on a blue sequence, but now you extend in the second extension, you extend through the green. So now what you've got is something that's half blue, half green. And what this would look like in your data set is this would look like a novel bacteria because it won't match anything that's previously in the database. And, um, you know, so you'll think you have these novel bacterial species when in fact what you have is chimeras. And people worry a lot about this. We worry a lot about this because right now we're trying to build a reference. And within a reference, um, if you have these chimeras, then you will have these databases that are filled with sequences that are artifacts of the PCR, not in fact true bacterial identifications. Um, but I guess I spend this time on the chimeras because if I were reviewing a paper from any of you and you didn't chimera check your paper, uh, you didn't chimera check your sequences, uh, I, I would tell you to go back chimera check and um, send me the paper again because I don't even, you know, I really don't. Uh, there's just, the rate of chimerism is actually significant. You know, it, there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of question, but there are a lot of people who are becoming convinced that the rate of chimerism is actually higher than we had um, even previously appreciated. So there are a lot of people who are working on algorithms to do this chimera checking. Um, Pintail is um, one of the methods, and um, Bellerophon is one of the methods. So again, you know, what, there's, what these are doing is that they go back to this type of information and what they do is that they they look at the whole sequence but then they'll look at what does this end of the sequence match and what does this end of the sequence match and if those match two different bacterial genera then it is likely to be called or at least flagged as a chimera and you can go in and manually curate whether you want to accept this um, but the chimeras can occur between different genera there's also um, and other algorithms that are looking to see what would you do if you had chimeras that looked like they were from within the same genera. So we have Pintail, Bellerophon. Um, chimera Slayer uh, is probably the first one that can, uh, it's under development, but it, it can deal with um, uh, the, the, sorry, actually I mean shorter 454 XLR sequences. So. Again, this is, they're trying to develop this so that it can be, it can be used with um, 454 sequences. And again, this is the same like the Bellerophon where you look at the two different ends of the sequence and say, do these look like they are from the same bacterial sequence? The other thing that you need to look at um, if you're taking samples from a human is you need to deal with the host sequence contamination. Um, and it's really important because for the IRB, when, when we can send individuals into our clinical study, um, 
you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be putting their human DNA when I've told them I'm going to put their bacterial DNA onto, you know, into these databases on the, that are publicly available on the web. Um, ethically, you really should make every attempt to filter the sequences from human subjects before submitting to the public databases. Um, and this. But it, this is something else that the Human Microbiome Project is working on because um, I think this is something that we want to develop uh, community standards for. Um, so, I mean, what you typically do is that you make it that it has to have a positive signal that it looks like a bacterial DNA and it does not look like a human DNA. Um, and so we've filtered all of our sequences, and we do this before we do any further analysis to make sure that we aren't um, putting human sequences into the databases. Okay, so now you've got your sequences and you've removed the two things that I worry about, the chimeras and the human contamination. So how do you align your sequences to start thinking about whether you've had a shift in the microbial diversity? Well. I mean, we're all fairly familiar with programs like BLAST, where you can BLAST two sequences together, or Clostel that, you know, allow you to put a lot of sequences in. But the issue is that if you use one of these programs, you lose a lot of the information, which we do have about the 16S structure, which is to say, if I have to put a gap in between two sequences, should I put that gap into a conserved region or should I put it into a variable region? Well, I probably actually, knowing what I do about the 16S sequence, would put it into the, into the loop structure rather than the conserved structure. So there are programs that um, NAST, and now, um, as I said again, NASTier is the broad adoption of NAST for 454 sequences. But this takes what we do know about 16S sequences and does a fixed width character alignment so that, you know, it, 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 it gives you, it puts the gaps in, it puts the base pair changes in, it, it understands the structure of the 16S sequence to do an alignment for you. And then from that, you can build a phylogenetic tree so that you can begin to look at what types of sequences do I have here? And um, what is the, the branch length between these different sequences? So if you go into ARB, which is the sort of probably the first database that you would look at, um, it then reads out for you, this is, I can't read it on this screen, but you know, here you have 59 sequences that are in this category, 42, and you can open these out and see what you have. But really what you want to do, if you want to do a, any um, more sophisticated um, computational analysis, is that you want to define these taxonomic groups. And so um, you're, you're probably going to have to delve into this, but this is where um, Patrick Schloss has developed a suite of software tools called Doter, Sans, and now Mother, which is a group of all of these analyses. And DOTER, the, the root of this is Operational Taxonomic Unit, OTU. And what this gets around is this concept, Operational Taxonomic Unit is sort of another, is, a, is, a, uh, is, is our way of saying that this is a species. Um, because species really means something if you have organisms that involve, that, you know, engage in sexual reproduction, and you can talk about whether the F1 is fertile um, to produce an F2. But in terms of bacteria, they undergo transduction, conjugation. I mean, it's, the, you know, they could have the same 16S sequence and not really be the same species. So taxonomic unit is a way of saying they have the same 16S sequence and get, and moving away from the concept of species, although that's what we probably, that's what we sort of, the equivalent of what we mean. So OTUs will cluster sequences based on how close they are to each other. So this is from the original Doter paper, and what you see here is that um, depending on how similar you want your sequences to be, you you can look at the variation. So if I say that everything in my group has to be at least, you know, has to be 100% identical, 
then it looks like every sequence that I got, that um, Patrick Schloss characterized here, every sequence is unique. He's only, this is the original paper, so this is only looking at 140 sequences. But, you know, at that level from, this, from the environment, every sample is unique. Now, if you started allowing for there to be 3% difference so that they're 97% identical, then, you know, there's, then there begin to be sequences that are clustering together. And, you know, now we're obviously doing many more sequences and getting many more repeats. And um, to put things at the species level, we often classify at the 97 or 99 percent identity. And I should say, I'm sorry, I didn't include in these slides, and I should have said at this point, um, that when we look at the sequences, we often apply a lane mask. And um, uh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't put that in the slide, so if anyone has questions, you can just ask me about that. But what I mean by that is that we often don't examine the most variable sequences because they can um, change and then revert. And um, often in those real loop structures, the, the, the change in sequence base pairs is actually greater than the other regions. So we want to look at something that seems to be all, um, the sequences are all being uh, changed at the same evolutionary rate. So um, with the abundance of sequences that we have, we're typically clustering at the 97 or 99 percent identity. And then what we want to start doing is we want to start thinking about how similar are these groups. Um, and so we have two ways that we can think about how similar are these groups. Community membership and community structure. And these are two different methods. Community membership um, gives predominance to the rare species. So in this case, with this example here, I'm saying how many categories do they share? So group A has a banana, but group B doesn't. Same with the pear. So if you look at this, the number of categories of fruit that they share is only 40 percent. They only share two out of the five. But if you ask how many pieces of fruit do they have in common, now you're giving more weight to the dominant species. And so you say, you know, if I find this orange here, do I find this orange in this fruit salad? Do I find, if I, you know, and, and you're going to find the orange 34 times and it's always going to be in the other, you know, from A and B. And there are going to be six times when you pick up a piece of fruit and it's only in the fruit salad of A and not in B. So that's where the community structure would look like 94 percent here because that's about each individual sequence instead of how you grouped them. So um, you can also, the t other term that, we, that is used is whether it's weighted or unweighted. And weighted means you've given greater weight to the dominant species. So, um, in this, which is um, understandably hard to read, but what I'm trying to show here, um, which you can, is that um, in that same analysis where Jeff Gordon showed that the obese mice um, clustered together, they all had the same in, um, change in the ratio of firmicutes to bacteriodites. In fact, if you looked at their community membership, um, the mice are most similar to their mothers. So this is M3, is mother three, and then all of her pups are most similar to her in community membership. So the mice inherit the microbiota from their mother. Um, so for community structure, they look like who, you know, that's genotype dependent, what types, what the ratio of sequence is in, but the actual individual identification of the sequences, the pups will look most like their siblings, the pups will look most like their mother. So those would give you two different pieces of information. And they're not, um, you know, they're each correct. A pup looks most like its mother in terms of community membership, but a pup looks most like other individuals of its genotype when you consider community structure. So, sorry, that was sort of the other example where, you know, pups will cluster based on their genotype for community structure. Um, and the, the method that Patrick Schloss developed of DOTER is um, really, um, uh, Rob Knight's group has developed Unifrac, which is a unique fraction metric. 
But again, this is really, as I was saying, this can be you know, weighted or unweighted. It's really the same principle where they're looking at community membership, community structure, um, and um, there are p-values that can be um, assessed for uh, unifract, and there are visualization techniques. So this is really, um, you know, it, it, it allows you to do the same types of um, analyses, um, and that's really, those are, um, you know, sort of the two major groups of um, analysis tools. So how much diversity is there in a population? Well, there's um, techniques for calculating that too once you've defined your operational taxonomic units. And this gets to the point of how deep do you need to sequence? I mean, how many dominant groups do you expect to see? How many were rare groups? This is the easiest one to calculate, I think, is the, the Chow-1 rare, rare faction curve. And what you see here is just some, you know, our first runs of, of a sequencing where in the, in the you know, in the, between the toes, we saw that there was really um, four predominant species. So if I'm doing Sanger sequencing, um, I'm probably not gonna be able to capture that many more rare species because there are these dominant, um, pr predominant sequences. But in the umbilicus or the belly button, you know, as I sequence 400 sequences, I've captured um, 55, but, because of the way the sequences, I keep finding rare sequences, um, I predict that if I kept sequencing, I would find many more. Um, and if you really want to get into, um, you know, a deeper analysis within that, there are um, indices that have been developed by the ecological people to look at um, the the number of OTUs that we just, you know, that we sort of just talked about, the richness, so that would be the number of, of um, OTUs, the evenness of them, and the diversity. So the evenness is, you know, whether there's one predominant and then many rare or whether they're spread out. Um, so many of these types of indices have been, you know, there, there are algorithms for calculating that. Um, this is just a note, if you are gonna use 454 sequencing, I think you should consider this um, method of VAMPs to form the operational taxonomic units. And the reason I say that is because on an individual read basis, there still is a fairly high number of errors within 454. So you don't want the, if you're classifying sequences at 99% identity, um, but there is an error in your 454 sequence read um, because of the, just the, um, you know, the error rate of individual reads on 454. You, you don't want that your sequence identity is driven by um, the error rate of 454. Oops, wrong way. Um, so everything that I talked about for bacterial diversity, we there are similar strategies being developed for classifying fungal diversity, um, but those are really um, probably at this point uh, not yet ready for prime time, but um, if, if Chair invites me back in a year and a half, hopefully we'll have made more progress on that. So this is just a highlight to sort of give you an idea of what type of sequence diversity we have found. So this is on the human skin, and what we what we found was that the 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 the, the ecosystem really determines the bacterial diversity. So the, the blue sequence, the blue um, text here means that this is an oily surface, and you can see that they are predominated by this dark blue propionobacterium. The green are the moist surfaces, and those have a predominance of these um, green proteobacteria. And the, the red are the dry sites, and these actually have the greatest diversity of all the sites, but that at each site, and you'll see this actually here better, each site there is different microbiome diversity. So when you look at the back of four different people, it's all predominantly this propionobacterium. And that's quite different than if you look at the antecubital crease, which is the bend of the elbow of those four people. So the, the, the site is more determining of the microbial diversity than the individual. And the bacteria that can live in a moist environment like the crease of the, the bend of the elbow 
is quite different than the bacteria that make their home in the sweaty armpit, which has large hair follicles. And this is um, nicely illustrated in, in Rob Knight's work, where you can see when he does a principal coordinate analysis, the green are the oral cavity samples, the blue are the gut, and you can see how they cluster away from the pink, which are the skin sites. Um, there is some mixing, though, of course, when he's looking at some of the sites, um, but you can also see that here in his um, unifrac analysis of what sites group together, and that you know the the sites, the left versus right. That's you know the left versus right of the arm is not that. Um, different, it's really between the sites and then between the individuals. So I just gave some references for what are the sort of, you know, if you're interested in more about the techniques or more about the Human Microbiome Project. And um, now I have a few other comments to make about what else are we trying to do. That was the bulk of my talk, but I'd like to kind of give some other comments um, about the technology in case these are things that people came to hear. So we can also um, sequence the whole genome of bacteria, and again, this is pretty technology-driven, um, and Elliot Margulies went over the Roche 454 and the Illumina Alexa. but really what's happened is that we've moved away from cloning. So it's not just that these, these technologies are much cheaper per base pair, but it's very hard to clone bacterial DNA into bacteria. So when we used to have to make libraries and then sequence them in Sanger, well, it, everything was cloned into a bacterial promo, you know, into a bacterial plasmid. But a bacterial plasmid doesn't like to have another bacterial promoter sequence in it. It actually doesn't mind having a eukaryotic promoter, but it doesn't like having a bacterial promoter. So when you tried to sequence and clone bacterial DNA, what you would miss was the promoters of the genes, and that was often the first, you know, the beginning sequences of the bacterial um, open reading frame. So when we get away from cloning as our way of making libraries, we can actually get a much better coverage of the sequence of a bacterial genome. So with these, what we get are these, and I know Eric Green went through this in terms of how to do an alignment. We end up with these, um, we, get, we end up with these reads, which are, you know, whatever length they are, and then um, as they talked about, we get these paired end reads where you get like 200 base pairs from two different regions, and for bacterial genomes, it seems that the sweet spot is to get them 8 kb apart. So from the, the unidirectional reads, you build these contigs, and then with these paired ends, you get um, some sequence from this region plus some sequence from this region, and you can bridge between those two. So. There are, and I know um, other people went through this, there are assemblers that we use to assemble these sequences. This is all done computationally. It's really actually pretty straightforward. Um, the 454 Roche uses Nubler. Um, Elliot, um, you know, has an expertise in developing uh, Velvet, which was really developed by Ewan Bernie's lab. And then you can look at evaluating these assemblies, and um, there are these sorts of um, algorithms for how much coverage do you need. We generally, depending on, uh, if we're doing Roche sequencing, we generally oversample, so we get like 20 times oversampling, and that allows you to have these contexts that start at the different places and get the assemblies. Now, what's cool about those coverages is that when you're doing 30-fold coverage, things that are at different than, you know, the genome level pop out at you. So here, um, these contigs are, um, this is a log curve, so you're looking here at what is a 500 base pair contig and a 1 kb contig, and you can see that this is really what is, um, you know, we sequenced here at like 30-fold coverage. So most of our contigs are big contigs, so ignore everything smaller than 500 base pairs. Those are just un individual reads. We get 30-fold coverage, and this is um, Staph aureus. And what you see are some of these things that are at two-fold coverage, so this is a plasmid. Some things that are at five-fold coverage, this is the RNA operon, I was saying that they're at like five, you know, there's five copies of them. Here's another plasmid that pops out, and here's another plasmid that pops out. So when you look at just these contexts, the things that are oversequenced are, are bits of the genome 
that are there at higher than you know, one copy number. And those things just pop out for you. And here we're really talking about, you know, is there, so one of the things that we're interested in now that I was um, alluded to before is, is there a reference genome? So, you know, we talked about things might have the same 16S sequence, but here's an example, and there are many more of these, of a streptococcus where um, Claire Fraser Liggett's group went in and sequenced, um, so 12 of these genomes. And what she found was that as she sequenced additional members, she kept finding new genes. That even though they would have the same 16S sequence, they had different genes in them. And that's because they engage in horizontal gene transfer. Now over on the right, so she kept looking at when she goes to 12 genes, how many new genes was she finding and how many genes did each one have? What she found was that as she kept sequencing, she kept finding unique genes. And so in the case where this would, um, if this curve, when she, when she kept sequencing new genes, if that went down to zero, then she would say, well, at least I've identified all the genes. But no, every time she would sequence a new genome, she kept finding new genes, meaning that this is an open genome that it can um, keep bringing in new pieces of DNA. And there are examples like Staph aureus, which has a very dynamic genome, but if you sequence Staph aureus that's present in hospital um, isolates, this USA 300, it has actually driven to being a, a fairly fixed genome. So with whole genome sequencing, we can find deletions, we can find mutations, we can find insertions. You can do comparisons between different genomes. So um, I just want to spend, again, you know, these are just sort of small vignettes that I wanted to talk about. But this is another um, role uh, or another type of microbiota are, of course, the viruses. And these um, are also about technology driven um, is that the viruses, what's causing these new diseases, and a lot of this is even now zoonotic transmission about, you know, animal to human transmission, or a, a virus that is associated with a disease, but we never, we, 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 you know, we've never detected that before. Um, so examples are SARS and the Merkel cell carcinoma. So what people can do now, and the price is dropping, but what people can do now is you can take samples from people who have um, a chronic or an acute disease, and you can do the sequencing, and then you just digitally subtract out the human DNA, and you can find from that what are the sequences that might match viruses. So the, the issue here is that this is quite expensive, because you have to sequence basically an entire human genome and then throw away that data to look for these viruses. But once you've done that, then anyone else who wants to see, does this kid with diarrhea have this type of viral infection, that's really cheap for them to do because they just need to do a PCR. You spend all the upfront cost finding the virus, um, but then uh, other people, again, could use some sort of phylo chip or could do a PCR-based assay. So it's about an initial investment to find these viruses that um, are infecting humans um, and then a much cheaper assay in the, in the future. So I'm just going to talk about, uh, in a few slides, uh, this arena virus that was found in, what happened was that there was an, um, three people who got organ transplants from one individual, and um, after getting these transplants, then they all three, um, they all three died. Um, and you can see that they all three rapidly declined. Um, and of course they are on immune suppressions, but what, was ha what they did with these three people was that um, they sequenced the RNA from all of these individuals. And it, it really is the needle in the haystack because they have to throw away all of the human sequence. But they did find um, fragments that matched an old world arena virus. And from that, they could then PCR walk and find this complete new virus that was infecting these individuals. This is true of everything I've said, and so this is where I'm, you know, starting to wrap up. Sequencing is just the start. I mean, we will find correlations, even in that case with that arena virus. You know, they don't find it in other people, and they find it in all three of these patients who have died, 
But that's really just the beginning because what we are generating is hypotheses and then they need to be um, corroborated. And, um, you know, so the first one of Cox's postulates can be sequenced, sequence based, that you find this in the people who are sick, but you don't find it in the healthy people. But the rest of them really require biology because you need to be able to grow the microorganism. You need to be able to establish the mechanism by which this microorganism would establish a, dis a disease. Um, and so it, it, that's a really different component. Um, and um, it's sort of like finding you know, a, a gene locus in a human and then trying to figure out how that's causing the disease. So the final um, few slides are just on this concept of, you know, we're going to get a lot of sequence. And so the ultimate goal is not even the 16S, which is just a signature of the bacteria or the 18S of the signature of the fungi, but really to understand how all of these organisms um, coexist. Um, and so that's the metagenomics concept that I brought up in the beginning, where you'd like to just be able to scrape someone's skin and from that say, Here's the entire microbial profile. So, and, and, and the reason that this is important is that you could be misled. So if you looked at these two populations, A and B, and you looked just at like what types of shapes of bacteria do I have, you would say I have four circles, um, one squiggle, and three rectangles. And you know, down here I have two rectangles, four, five circles, and a squiggle. So they might look pretty similar, but if you see one of the actual genes that are in those bacteria, um, you know, this is a huge representation of these pink genes, which is some gene that's, you know, encoded in all of these bacteria, but you didn't pick that up by 16S, but this pink gene is something that allows it to adapt to live in habitat A. But it doesn't have that much of the green, whereas, you know, this one, this population, has a lot of this green that allows it to live in habitat B, and everyone has a lot of this blue. Say this is the 16S gene, which is an essential gene. So metagenomics will get you beyond. There may be two different bacteria that have two different 16S signatures, but have the same gene content or the same protein encoding potential to live in that habitat. So um, we are starting to see more metagenomic sampling. But the problem is that once you get those metagenomic samples, we don't really have the tools to know what the bacteria protein coding potential is. So you get a lot of information about the bacterial phylum and what types of sequences, you know, do you have. But then when we go into these COG or KEG complexes, which is just the catalog of orthologous genes, I mean, it, it, it just doesn't give you much resolution. You've got this large amount of sequence, and then we just don't have very much information to classify these sequences. Um, but I'd like to finish by just even, you know, asking the question about, you know, how are we as Americans, um, you know, what is our relationship to our microbiota? Because there is this over preponderance right now of wanting to kill all the bacteria that live on our bodies and in particular on our skin um, without understanding that the bacteria are really contributing to our health. Um, and part of the goal of this project is really to lose the language of warfare and to understand ultimately what is the relationship between these microorganisms um, between each other and also with our own human cells so that we don't um, really have as our goal anymore to sterilize our bodies, but to live in peace and harmony with our microbiota and use that to consider that the microbiota are not just driving infections, but are actually um, also promoting our health.